a lot of confusion revolves around SEO because like no one understands how the Google bot actually like works. Hello and welcome to another episode of SEO Mythbusting. With me today is Suze Hinton from Microsoft. Suze, what do you do at work and what is your experience with front-end and SEO? Yeah, so right now I'm doing less front-end these days. Mm. I focus more on IoT. So in the time you were front-end developer? Yeah, I was a front-end developer for I think 12 or 13 years. And wow. so I got to sort of work on lots of different contexts of mm. front-end development, different websites, things like that. Cool. Yeah. Today I wanted to like just address like a bunch of stuff about Googlebot specifically and like nerd out about Googlebot because that cool. was the side of things that I was sort of the most confused about at the time. So Googlebot is basically a program that we run that does three things. Okay. Uh, the first thing is it crawls, then it indexes, mm -hmm. and then last but not least there's another thing that is not really Googlebot anymore, that is the ranking bits. So we have to basically grab the content from the internet mm -hmm. and then we have to figure out what is this content about, what is the... What is the stuff that we can put out to users looking for these things? And then last but not least is like, which is which of the many things that we've picked for the index is the best thing for this particular query in this particular time, right? Got it, yeah. So, but the ranking bit, the last bit where we like move things around, <laughs> that is informed by Googlebot, but it's not part of Googlebot. Is that because like there's this bit in the middle, the indexing, like the Googlebot is responsible for mm -hmm. the indexing? Yes. And making sure that that content is yes. useful for the ranking engine to kind of... Then, absolutely. Okay, absolutely. You can imagine like someone has to, in a library, someone has to like figure out what the books are about and like get the index of, of the bits in a catalog, the catalog being our index really. <laughs> and then someone else is using that index to make informed decisions uh, and, and like going like, here, this book is what you're looking for. <laughs> I'm really glad you used that analogy because I worked in a library for like four years. Oh, yeah. so you know much better than I <laughs> how that works. And so. I was that person. People would be like, I want Italian cookbooks. And I'm like, well, it's 641.5495. And you would just like give it to them. <laughs> <laughs> so if, if I would come to you as a librarian and ask a very specific question, like, <laughs> so what is the best book on making making apple pies really quick. Would you be able to like figure out from the index of, you probably have lots of cookbooks. In we that did, case. yeah, we had mm. a lot. But given that I also put lots of books back on the shelf, I knew which ones were popular. Ah. I have no idea if we can link this back to Google. That, but that does, it's, it's the, yeah, it's pretty much so you have the index that yeah. probably doesn't really change that much unless you add new books to new the, editions right, of like, exactly, yeah. yeah. Okay. So you have this index, which Googlebot provides you with, mm -hmm. but then we have the second, the librarian, the second <laughs> part, that basically based on how the interactions with the index work, figure out which books to recommend to someone asking for it. So that's that's it, pr pretty much the exact same thing there. Like someone figures out what goes into the catalog and then someone uses it. I love this. This makes total yeah. sense to me. But I guess that's still not necessarily all the answers you need, right? Yeah, I just want to know, like, what does it actually do? Like, mm -hmm. how often does it crawl sites? Like, what does it do when yeah. it gets there? Like, what is it sort of, how is it generally behaving? Like, does it behave like a web browser? That's like, a really good question. Yeah. yeah. Generally speaking, it behaves a little bit like a browser. At least part of it does. Okay. So the very first step, the crawling bit, is pretty much a browser coming to your page. Um, either because we found a link somewhere, or you submitted a sitemap, or um, there's something else that basically fed that into our, our systems. Uh, you can use Search Console to give us a hint and, and ask for re-indexing, and that triggers a crawl before. I've done that before. Oh, yeah. very I have good. re asked for it to be done again. And yeah. that is perfectly fine. Okay. Um, but the problem then, obviously, is, is how often do you crawl things, and how much do you have to crawl, and how much can the server bear, right? If you're on the backend side, you know mm -hmm. that. You have a bunch of load, and that might not be always the same thing. If it's like a Black Friday, then the load is probably higher than on any other day. So what Googlebot does is it tries to figure out from what we have in the index already, is that something that looks like we need to check it more often? Does that probably change? Is it like a newspaper or something? Got it, yeah. Or is that something like a um, retail site that does have offerings that change every couple of weeks, or even do not change at all, because this is actually the site of a museum? That changes very rarely, like for the for the exhibitions maybe, but like a few bits and pieces don't change that much. So we try to like segregate our index data into something that we call um, daily or fresh, and that gets crawled relatively uh, frequently. And then it, it becomes less and less frequent as we discover. And if it's like something that is super spammy, 
or super broken, we might not crawl it as often. Or if you specifically tell us, oh, don't, no, do not, do not index this, do not put this in the index, this is something that I don't want to uh, show up in the, in the search results, then we don't come back every day and check, right? So you might want to use the re-index feature. If mm -hmm. that changes, you might have a page that you go like, no, this shouldn't be here. And then once it has to be there, you want to make sure that we are coming back and, and indexing again. So that's the, that's the browser bit. That's the crawler part. But then a whole slew of stuff happens um, in between that happening, us fetching the content from your server, and the index having the data that is then being served and ranked. So the first thing is we have to um, make sure that we discover if you have any other resources on your page, right? The, the crawling cycle is very important. So what we do is the moment we have some HTML from you, we check if we have any links in there or images for that matter or videos, something that we want to want to crawl as well. And that feds, feeds right back into the, the crawling mechanism. Now, if you have a gigantic uh, retail site, let's say, just hypothetically speaking, <laughs> um, we can't just like crawl all the pages at once, both for right. our resource constraints, but also we don't want to overwhelm your service. So we basically try to figure out how much we can put, how much strain we can put on your service and how much resources we've got available as well. And that's called the crawl budget oftentimes, but it's pretty tricky to determine. So one thing that we do is we crawl a little bit and then basically ramp it up. And when we start seeing errors, we ramp it down a little bit more. So like, oops, sorry for that. We are not, oh. Uh. <laughs> so whenever your server serves us 500 errors, um, there are certain tools in Search Console that allow you to say like, hey, can you, can you maybe like chill out a little bit? But generally, we don't try to like get all of it at once and then then ramp down. We are trying to like carefully ramp up, ramp down again, ramp up again, ramp down again. Got so it. it fluctuates a little bit. There's a lot more detail in there than I was even expecting. Like I didn't even know that. I guess I never considered that a Google bot like sort of crawling event could put strain on somebody's website. Like yeah. that sounds like it's a lot more common than I even thought it would it, be. It does. It does happen, especially if we discover, say, uh, a page that has like lots of links to to sub pages. Then all of these go into the crawling queue. Got it. And then you might like these have links to. Let's say you have like a thirty different categories of stuff. And each of these have uh, a few thousand products and then a few thousand pages of products. So we might go like, oh, cool. Right? <laughs> crawl, 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 crawl. Yeah. And then we might crawl like uh, a few hundred thousand pages. And if we don't spread that out a little bit, so it's a weird balance, right? On one hand, if you add a new product, you want that to be surfaced in search as mm -hmm. quickly as possible. On the other hand, you don't want us to take all the bandwidth that your server <laughs> offers. <laughs> I mean, cloud computing makes that a little less scary, I guess. But I remember the days, I'm not sure if you remember the days where you had to like call someone and they ask you to send a form or fax a form, and then like two weeks later, you get the confirmation letter that your server has been started. Yes, I remember the days when we would have to call, and then we would basically pay $200 to have a human <laughs> Like go down the aisles and like push the physical reset button on the server. So yeah, those yeah. those times were I not, those not trickier. Yeah, mm -hmm. and then imagine uh, you basically renting five servers somewhere in a data center, and, yeah. and that taking a week, and then we come and and scoop up all your bandwidth, <laughs> and you're like, great, we're offline today because Google has its crawl day. That that's not what we want to have. Yeah, right? these days it's more of a, like a hacker news kind of moment when yeah, exactly, you get hit. So, exactly. So I feel like you're much more considerate than yeah. We try to not <laughs> overwhelm anyone and we respect the robots txt so that works within the crawl step as well and once we have the content we can't put strain on your infrastructure anymore so that's fantastic but modern web apps being mostly javascript driven mm -hmm. um, we then put that in a queue and then once we have it we have the resources to render it we actually use another headless browser kind of thing we call that the web rendering service then there's other crawlers as well that might not have the capacity or the need to run JavaScript. Mm -hmm. This is like um, social media bots, for instance. They they come and look for metadata. If yeah. that meta tag is coming in with JavaScript, you usually have a bad time, and they're just like, sorry. Yeah, so that's so. always been a big myth. Is and I remember when um, single page applications or spas really mm. came into vogue. A lot of people were really concerned. There's a lot of FUD around. Well. If crawlers in general don't execute JavaScript, then they're going to see a blank page. And how do you get around mm -hmm. that? So, so contextually within Googlebot, like it sounds like Googlebot 
executes JavaScript, you do. even if it does do it at a later point. Yes, correct. So that's good. That's good. But like, is there anything that people need to be aware of beyond just, oh, well, it'll just run it, and then it'll see exactly the same thing as like a human with yeah. a phone or a desktop yeah. would see? There's a bunch of things that you need to be aware of. Okay. So the, the most important thing is, again, as you said, it's deferred. It happens at a later point. So if you want us to crawl your stuff as quickly as possible, that also means we have to wait to find these links that JavaScript injects. Wait, like basically, we crawl. We have to wait until JavaScript is executed. Then we get the rendered HTML, and then we find the links. So okay. the, the nice little short loop that finds these links really, relatively quickly right after crawling will not work. right? So we will only see the links after we, we render it. And this rendering can take a while, because the web is surprisingly big. Yeah, just a little bit. I mean, it was like 130 little... trillion docs oh in 2016. So, oh, so like, there's way more now. Yeah, there's, there's way, way more, more now. There's way more than that. So, so robots.txt is very effective at being able to sort of tell bots mm -hmm. how to do a certain thing. But in this scenario, like, how do you tell that like it's Googlebot visiting your site. You That's know, a good as opposed question. To other yeah. yeah. So as we are basically using a browser in two steps, one is the crawling and one is the mm -hmm. uh, the actual rendering. Both of these moments, we do give you the user agent header. But basically, there's the string list, literally the string Googlebot in it. Oh, that's so right? straightforward. Yes, and you can actually use that to help with your SPA uh, performance as well. So okay. as you can detect on the server side, oh, this is a Googlebot user mm -hmm. agent requesting, you might consider sending us a pre-rendered static HTML version. And you can do the same thing for the others. Like All the other search engines and, and uh, social media bots have mm -hmm. a specific string saying that they are a robot. Oh, OK. So you can then basically go like, oh, in that case, I'm not, I'm not giving you the, the real deal, the, the single page app. I'm giving you this HTML that we pre-rendered for you. It's called dynamic rendering. We have docs on that as well. The one thing that still doesn't quite make sense to me is, does the Googlebot kind of have different contexts? Like, does it sometimes pretend that it's so, like I, I, th I think of it as this little right. mythical mm -hmm. creature that's pretending to do certain <laughs> things. So like, does it pretend to be on a mobile and then a desktop? Like, are there different sort of I guess right. like user agents, even mm -hmm. though it still mm -hmm. says Googlebot? And can you differentiate between them? You are asking great questions because yes, we have okay. different user agents. So I'm not sure if you heard about mobile first indexing being rolled out and happening. I've heard that like. It's going to affect like how you're ranked potentially. That as well. Know if that's All right. A so rumor that's not, yeah. ah, that's two different things that get conflated so okay. often. So mobile first indexing is about us discovering your content using a mobile user agent and a mobile viewport. Oh, so okay. we are using mobile user agents and and the user agent string says so if it says something about Android in the name and then you're like aha so this is the mobile Google bot. <laughs> we have documentation on that. There's literally okay. a help center article that lists all these things. So we try to index mobile content to make sure that we have something nice to serve for, for people who are on the mobile. But we're not pretending like random user agents or anything. It, we, we stick to the user agent strings that we have documented as well. And that's mobile first indexing where we try to get your mobile content into the index rather than the desktop content. Huh, got it. And then there's mobile readiness or mobile friendliness. If your page is mobile friendly, it makes sure that everything is within viewport and you have large enough tap targets and all these kind of lovely things. And that just is a quality indicator. We call these signals. We have over 200 of them. So That's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> right, right? So Googlebot collects all these signals and then stuffs them as metadata into the index. And then when Got we it. rank, we're like, OK, so this uses on mobile. So maybe this thing that has a really good mobile friendliness uh, uh, signal mm -hmm. attached to it might be a better one than the thing where they have to like pinch zoom all the way out to be able to read anything and then can't actually deal with the different links because they're too close to each other. So that's one of the many. It's not the signal. It's one of the many signals. It's one of the okay. over 200 signals to, to deal with. I had no idea there were 200. Right. That's it's... like making me. I know, I know that you're not allowed to like share what they all are because like there has to be a certain <laughs> mystique around it because yeah. of I guess like a lot of SEO abuse in the past. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, that is a game that is still being played, and people are doing like weird stuff to try to game us. I bet. And the interesting thing with this is with the 200 signals, it's really hard to say which one gets you. Like uh, moving in the, the ranks, the weights of mm -hmm. each signal, because and they I'm... keep moving and they keep changing. So it's I love when people are like, "No, let's do this," and then look, my my rank changes. Like, yeah, for this one query. 
but you lost on all the other queries because you did like really weird and, and funky stuff for that. So just build good content for the users and then you'll be fine. <laughs> I feel like that it feels like less effort as well than like constantly trying to. Yeah. Yeah. But it's not an easy answer, right? You pay me to make you more successful on, uh, on, on search engines. And I come to you and say, like, so who are your users and what do they need and how could you express that so that they know that it's what they need? That's a hard one because that means <laughs> I basically bring the ball back to you and now you have to think about stuff and figure it out strategically. Um, whereas if I'm like, okay, I'm just gonna, you know, get you get you links or uh, do some funky tricks here and then you'll be ranking number one. That's an easier answer. It's the wrong answer, but it's the easier answer. So people are like, bit, yeah. links are the most important metric ever. And so I'm like, no, we have over 200. And uh, it's important, but it's not that important. And um, chill out, everybody. Uh, but this still happens. Yeah. I'm so glad it's better now. Like I right? feel, I feel actually more at peace in general with SEO as well That's after so speaking nice. to you today. Oh, <laughs> so good. So thank you so much for being with me here, and uh, has been a great pleasure. Yeah, thanks for uh, like answering all of my weird and wonderful questions about perfect the Google questions, Bot. Perfect it was awesome. opportunity. Did we bust some myths? I feel like we did. Fantastic. I think that's worth a high five. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks. Join us again for the next episode of SEO Mythbusting, where Jamie Alberico and I will discuss if JavaScript and SEO can be friends and how to get there.